Hi, Daniel. Titan, how are you doing, Titan? Hi, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. We uh, got been getting thoughts together for tomorrow, and I was telling Michelle that there's nothing worse than finishing the paperback version and realizing you still have to format the Kindle. It's literally <laughs> terrible. You you think you're done, and then you're like, oh my gosh, because it's basically formatting an entirely different book. So that that's a that's a blast. Uh, but luckily, around midnight, we managed to. Uh, to get it all done, so that that was good. You guys so. worked really hard. I must say, you guys have worked really, really hard. Oh well, you're kind. It'll, it'll, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm happy with it. It's funny going back because some of the pieces are like 2014, 2012, 2011. It's like a stroll down memory lane. So that's been neat, and a lot of them kind of came out of conversations with different people, videos you watch, different things, and that's been really, really fun. So I've I've enjoyed that a lot. So that's that's been neat. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully when the printed version comes out, I, uh, you know, I decided to do a smiley face on every other page, not every page. I hope readers <laughs> are happy with that. And, uh, you know, where's Waldo is hiding on one of the pages. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully people will find him and enjoy that. So, so we're all, we're all doing well. <laughs> that's great. That's great. You, know, you guys, you guys pulled it off in one, within the month, the whole book, you know, the interdailing one, like, that's like. <laughs> oh, the, the books are fun. They come together. And actually, I think Mr. Samuel Barnes just is coming in who wrote the Iconoclast. Look at this guy. Ah, oh, Samuel Barnes, the writer of the Iconoclast. There he is. Look at that guy. Uh, so he just put together. Mr. Barnes, how are you doing today, sir? Superb. How are you? You're doing all right? How are you enjoying America? Did you find a random bar to sit in to join this call? Uh, are you having, uh, like, uh, what would be very American? Barbecue? Chips, French fries. You know, what does your American lunch look like right now, Mr. Barnes? Uh, well, my American lunch is obviously me on a diet because I've literally just got coffee. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll probably go to Seven Eleven after this and get some junk food. You know, very nice. The American way. Yeah, you got to live it up while you're in the States, Mr. Barnes. Uh, exactly. You got to live it up. So, no, uh, I think um, our generation lives on coffee and laptops. That's actually the diet. They're going to redo the pyramid with the different food groups and have, like, meat, laptop, coffee, and then the rest. The pyramid will just kind of crumble apart, and there won't be anything else but laptop and coffee. Um, well, Mr. Barnes, you know, Cheetah, yeah, and Cheetown and I were just talking for a minute, so we're releasing Thoughts tomorrow, and I was, and you would know about this, the joys of realizing that that um, you still have the Kindle version to format when you think you're done with the paperback version. The, yeah, look at that look. That man knows. Uh, the moment of going, oh, no. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> um, and, and things like that in, in, in writing a book. Um, but no, I guess I, Chitan, one, I never think about sitting down and writing a book, I guess, personally. I just, whatever kind of explodes, and then one day you go, oh, look, there's some pieces to put together. So I don't know. I uh, Maybe it's just if you drink enough coffee, you stop thinking about it. Um, so, so now, Mr. So, you know, Mr. Barnes, we've been talking a lot about the possibility of development. Uh, we've been talking a lot about philosophy's role in what is development. We've had a lot of questions about does consciousness change? Uh, does the environment change people and different things like that? And I actually think this is fantastic because your book on the Iconoclast is talking about um, the dangers of philosophy. Does philosophy actually have a deconstructive element if it becomes a pure meta question? What's the relation of the dogmatist and the Iconoclast? So this is quite lovely. I might, I might love to for you um, to talk about your book for a second uh, because it would be interesting to think of uh, the, what you have explored in, in the context of this question of development. And we got into that because we were also talking about, say, uh, the difficulty of not being captured today, you know, and Justin Murphy, X, all that different thing to lose, you know, it's very difficult not to be captured um, by the algorithms. It's very difficult not to be, say, captured, end up in an episode of Black Mirror or Kafka or different things. And we talked about how there's something about certain kinds of thinking, say, I would associate with Hegelian dialectical thinking or Hume's thinking that's associating with the common life that's embedded in a common life. Um, absolute knowing, you know, then we also talked about Nietzsche's Overman and how all of these seem to be um, helpful for avoiding capture. But then I find it very interesting because there's also something about philosophy that in of itself can have a capturing dimension and lead to destruction. Uh, so it's so it's lovely to see you again. So if I were to ask you, Mr. Barnes, uh, what what is the iconoclast? What is it about? And to put you on the spot, uh, what would, how would you respond to that? Other than have the Zoom call suddenly drop. Uh, other than the Zoom call suddenly drop, how would you respond to that, Mr. Bond? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to avoid giving you the sales pitch right now and kind of relate it to what you guys, I know you guys have been okay. talking about. 
Um, so yeah, in regards to development, this is perfect because the, the book is in a, in a lot of ways, and this is especially true with the opening, it's, it's autobiographical and it's about my own development. I would say, I would say initially in philosophy and now kind of through philosophy, right? Because, because the, the book is kind of, essentially it's an answer to the question, what is philosophy? I, I sort of found the, you know, the reams and reams of text that have been written by others on that question, um, you know, that kind of didn't really fulfill me. They didn't feel sincere because I feel like that person would generally have some sort of motivation um, before. And, they, and, and it seems like a lot of the answers to the question, what is philosophy, are, you know, made up by philosophers to please us as philosophers um, to give us the answers we want here. So... This was kind of like, you know, if anyone would ask me why am I interested in these topics, I would, you know, give, give some sort of vague answer about meanings of life or talk about ethics or something like that, how to be the right, good sort of person, all that sort of stuff. But, but I sort of realized that, you know, if we look at these things quite blankly, the reason why, whenever we have a subject, especially in these discussions, we can relate it to something else is because philosophy is so, so open in. Is, uh, philosophy in, is, is the all encompassing method, and the language I use in the book is the meta question. Um, because I think it, it encapsulates all other sorts of inquiry, you know? So for every inquiry we have, whether that be science, art, um, there can be a philosophy of X. So there is a philosophy of science, philosophy of art. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's my theory of the meta questions. I think that the reason I was really interested in what is philosophy is because it is the ultimate question, it is the meta question. Um, and, the, and the book sort of takes that, you know, rejection of the answers to that question that have come before me um, through my own development and realizing this and sort of, you know, using that to very blankly ask, is there a point in me even doing this anymore? Is there a point in me engaging with philosophy? Can I actually even do philosophy, for example? Um, that would be my answer to what, what the Iconoclast is about, if I was to relate to what I know you guys have been talking about. And I'm so, I'm so glad to be, after weeks and weeks of absence, so glad to be back in here with you guys for at least a little bit during my lunch break. So... That's all tremendous. And I think it is interesting that philosophy is uniquely able to ask what is philosophy and that itself be a philosophical question. Whereas if I ask what is science, you know, there, there's an answer to that, but you really can't use the scientific method so much to determine what is science. So there's some interesting sort of dimensions to that. I think I mentioned this to you before. I find it interesting how you can always have a philosophy of X. And it also seems like you can always have a story of why. Uh, like you can always have a story of story. You can even have a story of story. Like what is the story of how story arose, right? You know, the story of history, the story of whatever. And I find it really interesting. That kind of links a little bit with Mr. Lieber's work, Luber's work on the difference in dialectical relationship between story and theme. Javier, good to see you, sir. I'm glad they haven't kicked you out of the university yet. That's really great. Um, uh, well done, sir. Uh, so I find the topic that you're exploring very interesting. And I think it's important to note, and then I'll give it to Titan, um, because if one does not see this unique characteristic, this unique meta dimension of um, philosophy, then I think the way one approaches it either in favor of a kind of development, which may be a process of going through it, and then we have to describe what that means. If one doesn't realize that, then they may engage in philosophy in a manner that only contributes to their capture, not in a manner that actually can, say, help avoid it, because philosophy can have an endless self-referential character to it, um, if one is not careful. But let me pass it to Mr. Titan, and it's great to see everyone. Tyler, great to see you as well. Thank you for being here. Hi, uh, Samuel, I just, I just got curious, you know, the way you started your answer. And to me, it's, it's always been a struggle to me, because... Uh, to me, philosophy very often becomes a general overall term. You know, it's it's very easy to say I'm doing philosophy when you're doing anything, in, in some senses. So, uh, do you struggle with that with, with, with that with that problem that there is something in in a very act of doing philosophy that resists philosophy in some senses? You know, uh, it, it's not simply that we can just go and do philosophy, like we can do other things, you know, we can do science, we can do linguistics, we can do some art or whatever, you know, but there's something about doing philosophy that that, that is its, its own self. And I think, you know, if you look at like, somebody like Foucault, you know, he, he has he, he struggled with that question and people would come up and say that, oh, I'm not a philosopher, I'm, I'm a critical theorist, or I'm a social theorist, or I'm a, you know, that even people would say I'm an anthropologist or a sociologist. Uh, many other times where, where they, they choose to classify themselves different from philosophy, even when they're working within that tradition in some senses. Do, 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 do you struggle with that, with, with that, with that question in your work? And stuff? 
Yeah, so what you've hit on there is, is really important. And this is where I want to be absolutely not sympathetic to anything I kind of want to present. I want it to be completely honest with the question as it stood, right? So when you talk about things like sociology or, you know, we're doing chemistry or uh, physics, for example, physics is a good example of this. All these inquiries are based on assumptions, right? So these, these things all have assumptions as their foundation. So physics is a good example because it takes materialism um, as a, you know, metaphysical foundation. Um, you know, it's got certain laws like fixed laws, like um, the law of, law of conservation of energy, for example. And basically, cognition precedes the inquiry from that point. This, this applies to basically every kind of human inquiry you can think of, any like place where philosophy of X fits. Um, the reason why this is important is because, like you, like you said, as, like, as human beings, we need those axioms to, to operate. And so, so and when, when, when we actually want to think philosophically, like, we want to think sincerely. We want to like, not push things off the table because they might not be the answers we want. And this is why through, through philosophy, you're able to, even though you're completely ensconced within um, a Christian morality, for example, you're able to do something like Nietzsche did, which is completely explode that apart. And that's, that's a very iconoclastic way of thinking, of, I believe. Um, but like you said, like you said, um, even, even these um, things like critical theory within the philosophical frame, um, you know, they might be called philosophy, they might be sub-questions of philosophy, but these things become dogmatic sub-questions in the same way that physics becomes a dogmatic sub-question when it, when it has these axioms. Now, this is not to denigrate, that's not to denigrate these sub-questions. They have, you know, usually immense utility for us, but I don't think it's right to call them sincerely philosophic and I, I feel like that 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 real like ex explosive philosophic force is only a very temporary thing as soon as it gets into the academy as soon as it gets into people organizing themselves it becomes one of these relegated sub questions it's some question that has utility nonetheless but not one that i would consider like philosophy like proper to be honest with you would you say that mr bowen said philosophy is essentially iconoclastic that it is in its very heart an iconoclastic force that has a tendency with time to turn into a dogmatic force once it kind of loses that energy. Can one almost see what you described? Philosophy starts off like kind of this explosive thing and then it gets into the sub question, the, the institutions, and then it becomes dogmatist. Uh, it, you know, it can kind of turn in that direction. Would that be a certain trajectory we could propose? Yes. So, I mean, you can have there's lots of like routes on this, you know, like can someone always think iconoclastically? I don't think so. I think, I think you're right. I think this explosive, pure logical force, which is completely un unapologetic, um, can sort of commune through the human, human cognition. But eventually once, once humans, like we need fixed points of reference, right? As soon as we, as soon as we instantiate those, which come usually very, very soon after that explosive, pure logical force, um, it, we, we, immediately, we, we immediately become, part of a sub-question, right? Something that's based upon axioms. And again, I, I think, uh, you know, critically, this is something that humans probably need for cognition. I feel like those iconoclastic moments, those purely philosophic moments, those, those moments of pure logic, they're only really going to very rarely happen. Is there a sense where it's kind of interesting because there's something about this explosive force or suggesting that it might help one escape capture, like if they're in a captured situation and then they have the philosophical insight that can be an explosive force out of the net, if you will, if the play on words or an explosive force out of the capture. But then it almost has a tendency to uh, almost be, I, I, you know, kind of almost suicidal where you escape through it and then it blows itself up and takes everything else with it, which seems very problematic. Um, but then there's also a way in which it's like the very thing that we, Need, could need to avoid capture can also be destructive in its own right. And you almost need like, and it's kind of funny because when you talk, you talk about the iconoclast as an anti-philosophy, there's a way in which at some point to bind philosophy, there has to be an anti-philosophical act of which philosophy, according to its own premises, will not want to engage in, but it needs to engage in for its own ability to avoid um, self-effacement. And so there's this way in which philosophy that doesn't have any sort of 
incorporation of anti-philosophy becomes a kind of autonomous rationality, as you know, I like to talk about, uh, which then becomes a force of effacement. So can we say, so let me ask you this, when you talk about the iconoclast being an anti-philosophy, is that something that comes at the end of philosophy, at the beginning of philosophy, something that ends, exists in a dialectic with philosophy? What does it mean to, be, for you, what does it mean to become um, anti-philosophical? And is there a necessary path one needs to go on to reach it? Yeah, I mean, to get to get to that conclusion, you need to basically sincerely examine the question, what is philosophy? And then you need to have the second question, which you can't have if you have an emotional attachment to this thing, which is, is there actually a point in this? Like, what is the use, use we're going to get out of this? Like, and, and my kind of point, my conclusion on that is that that iconoclastic mode of being is very inhuman. Which is why I keep saying we need those axles, we need those fixed, those fixed reference points. Um, and in, in that sense, the reason why I call it anti-philosophy is not necessarily because it's like completely negative on on what we can achieve through that iconoclastic mode of thought, but it's it's almost like anti-philosophical in its in a pro-human stance. And I, like I said, you know, the iconoclast is is that exception to the rule, and most human beings are a combination of of most use and actually like most most humans probably aren't able to you know embody that mode of thinking anyway um so we need those dogmatic modes first. no i like this idea and i'll give it to javier of its anti-philosophy in order to be pro-human that there's a certain point where one almost has to, in the philosophical process, recognize the need to become, quote unquote, anti-philosophy, to be pro-human. That's interesting. That almost suggests a certain skill, a certain level of discernment, a inner emotional ability to go through those difficult questions. You put it very well. You, you can't be overly emotionally attached to a certain question where you can't come through. And it's interesting then that that entire process screams of, a, of the need for a fuel, um, a full human being. I find that very, very, very interesting. And I'll pass it to Javier. Um, Tyler, I love you. Tyler's great. Um, Mr. Javier, good, good to see you, sir. Uh, good to see you guys. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little... <laughs> I sound a little nasally today. Um, you should so... be sorry. We don't allow any <laughs> nasally people here. You got to go. <laughs> Unbelievable. Nasally? Um, Frick. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about uh, this right now. Um, because as I've been reading uh, Barnes's book, um i couldn't help when he when he gets to the you know the point on cognitive interplay i couldn't help but seeing the the i and it and the i and thou for boober where um <clears throat> barnes acknowledges that it's inevitable that it has to collapse on it in on itself and become a dogmatic thing um boober also acknowledges this when we live in the world of what we call like I and it. Everything is ordered. Everything is nice and neat for us. Um, but it's inevitable that it becomes an I and it eventually, right? Um, and it's almost necessary for it to become dogmatic. And that, at least that's what I'm understanding so far from Barnes. It's, it's inevitable, so it almost becomes necessary. Um, the real question then becomes is we can't just live in a world of I and it and dogmatic impulses, Right. And I think this is where Boober and Barnes would agree with each other, that ultimately, if we live solely in a world of I and it and dogmatic impulses, then, you know, <laughs> we're going to have some problems. <laughs> but <clears throat> some of the things that I noticed that philosophy has always struggled with, the, the to me, the anti-philosophy is the praxis of what that is. You know, for example, like, We've always, at least, you know, when we talk about, at least when we talk about like Johannes and that whole community, right? A lot of the problem is how do we incorporate a praxis um, to get on this, you know, mode of thinking? And <clears throat> as much as I'm an advocate for answering like what is philosophy and constantly always going back to that question, um, my concern is always that there seems to be this unclarified praxis that needs to be addressed <laughs> because if we don't address the praxis, because the thing is, when we start asking these questions, we are doing some type of praxis. The question is, what is that praxis? Now, we could say, oh, well, philosophizing is the praxis, is the thinking. Um, you know, is so on. And yet somehow we've 
uh, at least from my understanding, we've always made that gap between theoretical thinking and praxis. We've always made that gap. So I, I guess, I mean, uh, my, my question for all of you and, and for Barn as well, um, how do you develop a consistent praxis to, I don't know, may, just to use like a Buddhist term, get to right thinking? <laughs> you know, because actually when you bring up the Freudian problem, right? The Freudian problem is this. If you don't have some level of discernment, you're going to continue the repetition and be stuck in the symptom. Um, so if we are constantly philosophizing, but never kind of discerning what is engaging the symptom, then are we, are we right thinking at all? You know, that, that's my main problem. Um, and, and Buddhism exposes this. Freud exposes this. <laughs> so that, that's my main problem. Um, and I'll leave it there. And I'm sure Tishan can respond to this because he had a magnificent paper in the Hegel Anthology, Enter the Alien, on why theory and practice should not be divided. Well done, Tishan. Uh, Obling paper, really well done. Um, as just a point, um, basically, you know, if, you know, because Mr. 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 Barnes in the Iconoclast mentions David Hume, you know, for Mr. David Hume, if philosophy doesn't leave common life, go on the philosophical journey, but then return to common life and embed into it, and philosophy is not in service of, dare I say, the lived in the actual, then it becomes very problematic. In philosophy, um, you can't have right thinking unless it is in um, service of something, uh, you know, whether it be the community, whether it be the common life, you know, that's the kind of the, the umbrella phrase. And when philosophy, you know, because for me, and, and Mr. Barnes can reply to this how, however he likes, um, for me to be anti-philosophical is in a sense to be anti-autonomous philosophical. The notion that philosophy never has to ultimately embed or ultimately be in service of something or ultimately be a handmaiden in something, where when philosophy becomes its own end, then it becomes this kind of black hole that sucks everything in, if you will. Whereas if philosophy is in service, there's a way in which you can almost view, if we take Livingston's book, there is a sense in which philosophy, I don't want to say is a necessary evil, but there's a way in which it's a kind of necessary evil because people are trying to trick you and they're trying to capture you and they're trying to manipulate you and because of and because they're also trying to pull you into their metaphysical framework by which to control you and there's something Foucaultian about that because of that you must engage in some kind of self-defense and it just turns out that philosophy is a weapon of self-defense now it's not just the weapon of self-defense uh, but there's something about it. it's like Daniel Frege talking about ontological design you have to engage in ontological design because there is always already a war of ontological design. You can say, well, I don't want to. Well, guess what? Too late. So likewise, you are always already in a world that is using philosophy to control, to manipulate, and so on and so forth. So you have to know what you're doing. And also, if we tie it into belonging again, one has to engage in philosophy so that they don't end up in Hannah Arden's banality of evil, which is the kind of thoughtlessness that then results in mass movements and different things. But there's a kind of tragedy. I think what I like what Mr. Barnes is stressing, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. And Jason, great to see you, sir, is that philosophy must be seen with a tragic sentiment. There must be a kind of tragic sentiment to it, where it's like this, it, it's not like holy good, like the love of wisdom is kind of tied to a love of life, which means a love of staying alive, right? There's a kind of self-defense. So there's this tragic element that has to be part of the story, which very often in, in philosophical conversation today, there is not. But I, you could also say there has to be a tragic sentiment in religion um, as well. And there's something about a good story having to have a tragic element to be any good. So those are thoughts. And then I'll pass it and then I'll give it to Mr. Barnes. Before though, I just want to add very quickly, Mr. Barnes, you are freaking elegant. Every time I read your books, I'm like, how the heck is this guy so elegant so well done your bleeding over the pages of your book pays off because the way you blend elegance and insight is very very inspiring it's just like missing axioms the same goes with uh the iconoclast so i'm always impressed with that i thought i would i would note that before passing to to you sir i could do without the flattery my ego is already big enough. not flattery if it's a statement of fact mr barnes it's not flattery if it's a statement of fact so just, just to return to the, the point of practice, because that is really important. This is why I thought, this is why I wanted to start with the question, what is philosophy? Um, and what is our position in relation to it? Is because that is that is the prerequisite for knowing what a philosophical practice looks like. Now, the, re the real open question is, is that, that purely logical, purely philosophic, as I define it, iconoclastic mode of thinking, do we have access to that? Or do we have to be dogmatic? Yeah. Now, 
the answer to that question is very important when it comes to prices in my opinion because if, if we if we are able to access it in some way even in very limited bursts we should consider that to be the philosophic ideal now that's not to say we can't find utility in our dogmatic thinking structures but we can utilize our kind of classic modes of thinking to you know destroy them blow them apart when they become you know stultified as things inevitably do um in existence not just in thought but also physically um that's you know just the law of extra and entropy, right? Second, second conclusion. What if it's completely inaccessible? To us? Now, this is this is something I kind of conclude in the book a bit later on as well. Is I kind of present a um, proposed philosophical practice if that iconoclastic mode of being actually isn't something we can get access to as human beings. That ideal isn't accessible to us. What I propose is for us to be meta dogmatic, right? So if we have to think dogmatically, then fine. That, that's fine. Like we ha we have to take axioms and we have to cognate from there. But as philosophically minded people, what's to stop us from thinking metadogmatically? What's, us, what's to stop us from um, embodying, even if it is um, a type of acting, embodying different value systems, right? To, to, to sort of have the greatest, the greatest purview over this meta question, if we're confined to dogmatic modes of thinking, how about you don't remain your entire life as a, as a, physical, as a materialist, right? How about, you know, spend, spend a year or so as part of a religious sect? Like, why, why wouldn't you try and get as much of a vantage point on all the parts of human experience? I, I think that that's also a possibility for us. But I, but I feel like the, the question of practice is really dependent on our ability to access that pure logic. Metadogmatist is a freaking cool phrase. Uh, I will note, I like that phrase. We were talking last week about this. You know, there's a, there's a number of terms going around that for me mean very similar things, if not the same thing. Absolute Noah Overman. We even brought up some of the spiral dynamic stuff. But they talk about turquoise and tier two and different things like that. Um, but there's but this kind of notion where a lot of those people have this, what you're describing there as a kind of metadogmatist ability to kind of move in and out of different systems. Uh, into thinking those different terms. Uh, but I know you have to go here in a minute, Mr. Barnes. Um, where can we buy your book and where can we give you all the money that we have? Where do we empty our ben bank account? Cool. So yeah, if you just go to, go to any web browser and type in iconoclast.energy, um, you will find a landing page. And from there, you can go and buy it as a physical book of Amazon. You can go and buy it as a digital. Oh, dude, they don't want him to sell his book. Uh, Zoom so, doesn't... Yeah. Okay, can you repeat what you just said? Because Zoom didn't want you to sell your book and froze you. Try again. Okay, go to Google, type in Iconoclast, throw, oh, give no, your no, bank okay, account okay, routing okay. number. Go to, go, to any, any, go to any web browser, your favorite way of getting to the web, type in Iconoclast.energy. From there, you can get the book in pretty much any format you can buy in physical from Amazon, you can buy it digital from Gumroad, or you can buy it in, for crypto from Canonic. So I've kind of made it available in any format you might like, the, any currency you might like to pay for it. Um, yeah, I got a class for energy. Check it out, guys. Mr. Barnes. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, sir. Congratulations on your work. Good luck with saving the world today, sir. We wish you all the best. Ciao. Dude, set up crypto. You can buy his book in crypto. I didn't know that was a thing. I feel so behind. I just formatted Kindle for thoughts, and I, don't, I didn't do anything with any crypto wallet i don't even know um it's actually a tremendous book i i do highly suggest it and it and uh it's not flattery he's extremely elegant and it's he puts things in a way that is very clear in, in builds and i think it's a great follow-up to missing axioms now javi i'm going to ask you in a minute what you think is the connection between what you're learning right now uh, on buddhism eastern thought and the iconoclast because i think there's some overlap and if you don't think there's overlap i'm still going to force you to try to find overlap whether you want to or not um i actually think the iconoclast um ties in quite well with thinking in terms that we've been kind of getting at on this. We've talked about kind of dialectical thinking, story and theme, action and thought. And I think it kind of clearly brings together some thinking that shows how philosophy, if it becomes a kind of autonomous philosophy, which I think we can think of in Hegelian terms as a philosophy that stays in the realm of abstraction and never negates itself into concretion, if I were to use Hegelian terms. So you stay in the realm of abstraction. And if we follow Hegel, if um, thought never becomes concrete, it's practically not even a thought, right? It's like we've talked about that. It becomes a kind of effacement. And I think his book traces out because, um, you know, following David Hume, following Dr. Livingston and different thinkers, that, that train of thought. And it's very interesting to think... Um, what, what would it mean to incorporate uh, the iconoclast in the question of how do we respond to the meta crisis, as we talked about last week? Um, what, uh, what also, too, we mentioned at the end of last week, the question of is it possible to create the conditions so that more people feel the call? 
of absolute knowing to respond to the meta crisis. What does it mean to respond to the meta crisis? Those are thoughts that were lingered. We don't have to discuss those, but I think the iconoclast fits in that conversation. I was also interested in, I'll note, and then I'll give it to Javier to speak about the iconoclast in terms of the Buddhist work that he's doing, and then anyone else who wants to speak. I'm also quite interested in the Dali uh, technology. I sent that article out where a lot of these art websites are not allowing AI um, uh, drawings and different things like that. And I'm really curious as that of a case study, like the question of how we respond to Dolly kind of makes me think if that's a case study to how you respond to the overall meta crisis, because Dolly as that AI generated imagery has a certain inevitability to it. You can't avoid it, but then how do you respond to it? But what does it even mean to respond to it? So you ignore it, so you brag. There's something about using that as a case study and we don't have to get this in today, but it's been, I've been thinking about like looking at that as a case study that might point to bigger questions of the meta crisis. So I'm interested in that. But first I will give it to Mr. Javier to discuss uh, the, whatever he likes to, he can talk about his cat and uh it's no trouble um because the cat is probably lurking behind him about to jump on his back and scratch him uh don't be nervous i don't see it behind you javier i don't see it behind you well thank you daniel um so one key word that barnes uses is um suspense of judgment which is a very almost like buddhist way of having right view what they call you know the eightfold path right view um <clears throat> It seems like a lot of Buddhist practice, they divide it in two ways, right? There is the mindfulness, and then there's like the insight. But somehow for Buddhist practice, in order for you to get to insight, you have to go through mindfulness first. So I think there's a way to look at Barnes's book <clears throat> as the iconoclast can be not, uh, can be a form of practice where you jump out of your own sub-question and simply observe um, what is going on, right? And then you jump back in. But it's this constant having time to jumping out that you are able to <clears throat> either create a new sub-question, as Barnes points out, or you rework that same sub-question that you're already in. Um, and this would be the, the the interaction between the dogmatic and the um, well, actually, when he div when he divides it into voice and exit, you know, it's either you the voice is um, reworking it, the exit is obviously getting out of here. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there there is something that is like at least somewhat of a Buddhist concept that uh, Barnes is proposing with this idea that actually. The true philosophical has no judgment. It has a suspense of judgment. So what is a suspense of judgment? I guess that's my, my next question. The only thing that I can come up with is it's just this um, witnessing. It's just this discerning, right? It's what Buddhists call, you don't, you don't, you don't allow yourself to get trapped in the thought, but then you don't push away the thought. You just simply register the thought. Like you just register it. Now, if Barnes is calling for this idea that we simply register the the sub question that we're in, rather than get ourselves involved in, with it, and then and also instead of rather pushing it away, we just simply register that it's a sub question. Then I think um, this can be an actually uh, beneficial, like more you know, philosophical way of actually gaining insight. Right. It's just the practice alone is the more you practice it, I'm assuming. I mean, this is what Buddhism's assumption is. The more you practice this thing, <laughs> you possibly gain insight. So, um, yeah, uh, that's my comments on that. If I think it's quite interesting because very often there seems to be a lot of these comments, like if we're following the, um, I call it the Humean journey, you know, this kind of journey from common life and, and, and back. And then you're talking about these Buddhist practices and the iconoclast. Um, and then Jason just now mentioned Hegel, exactly right. Uh, there was something about the Hegelian process. It's very interesting because there seems to be a notion, and we've talked about it before, um, where when people talk about practices, like I was listening to Bruce Alderman and he was talking with Layman Pascal over the integral stage. And he was talking about all the different monasteries, all the different religious groups that he's been part of practices, different yoga practices, and all these different things. And it's interesting because it's like, although we use the word practice, 
it's more like a journey, you know, it's like a development and there's like a journey language. Now that is hard to use now without it getting sucked into the Joseph Campbell hero's journey, which I think is fine, but there's also like, I think many journeys, I'll talk about the hero's journey, the philosophy journey and the community journey. Like there's different, uh, different journeys that one has to go in to reach the full part of that whole philosophical developmentism. But it does seem to be the case that, and then I'll pass it to Jason, that because we have this philosophical ability to suspend, that means we always have the ability to keep going because whatever situation we're in, we can pull ourselves out of and then advance, right? Like if you couldn't do that, you'd just kind of be stuck in your immediacy, right? But the very ability that we're able to abstract means we can always pull ourselves up and keep going. But this seems to be what tends to happen. Like what Barnes seems to be suggesting, and I think Hegel as well, and I'll give it to Jason, is you engage in abstract reasoning to pull yourself out to you yourself move forward, not to then turn around and deconstruct what is beneath you. Because that seems to be what the pure iconoclast will do, is they'll raise out of a situation and rather than move forward out of the situation in a developmental structure, they'll then use their meta position to turn around and deconstruct what they just pulled themselves out of, which of course they can always do because you can always ask the meta question. And therefore you can always turn it, and Jason, that's very good, and I'll give it to you. You, you since there is no such thing as a view from nowhere is what Jason just said when you when you make when you hold everything up to a standard of having to meet it being a view from nowhere in order to be legitimate then it has to become nowhere so there seems to be a difference between rising out of a concrete immediacy and then moving forward from the position of the meta question as opposed to from there turning around and deconstructing what's below you. So there seems to be a different orientation that I, I think we can associate with Hume that I think Mr. Barnes in the Iconoclast is bringing out. Dimitri, it's a pleasure to see you, sir. And Jason, thank you for being here today. Wow, Dimitri, great background. Look at that, that is so cool. Jason, good to see you today, sir. Good to see you too, guys. Uh... What an amazing group. Yeah, yeah. Dimitri, uh, please chime in too, because we literally just talked about it. I, I, it's very strange. Um, uh, we were talking about here uh, about the view from nowhere that you can, as it were, pull yourself up and look down and make a judgment as if that's uh, without a criterion. Right? We, we spoke about uh, Hegel, and in the phenomenology, he puts this as looking at thought you're looking at the absolute as if it is an instrument or a medium, right? That's how we put it. And basically, um, this this runs into the observer's effect, to put it that way. Like, like you can never kind of have a neutral perspective. Whatever you do is always... You, you always presuppose something. And that's, that's Hegel's point exactly. You start with the... You start with the positing, and then from the positing, and then we return to what you spoke of earlier, uh, we watch and learn. You posit it, you see where it goes. But I think, and Daniel, you were asking earlier, what do you call this? Uh, and someone went, um, what do you call it? Uh, suspense of disbelief, which is correct. But I think in science, we literally call this a hypothesis, right? You just hypothesize, you test it out, Bing, bang, boom. <laughs> Can you have such a thing as presuppositionless philosophy? Ah, yes. Uh, um, a presuppositionless philosophy. I mean, I open it to everyone by, by all means, because I don't think I know. I can, you know, who knows? But in my opinion, it's something like this. It's, it's If you, the first thing you do is negate. You always negate. That is, a you, you posit something. You come up with something. That becomes negated by something else. And the negation of this negation, which is to say this, uh, you, you presuppose something, you see how it goes in, in time, in history, and then you look back and you, and you look at the, what's called the determinate negation. What, what gives it, what, how do you tie back the content of it to the form of it, you know? And from that, you can have a presuppositionless philosophy philosophy, which is to say you cancel out your presupposition because now it's concretized in time. So it's Hegel is not saying as if ah, I have this presupposition and uh, it's infallible, it's airtight. You know, that's not at all what a presuppositionless philosophy is. It's more like it's a return to 
to it. Mr. Samuel Barnes was here for a little bit talking about his new book on the iconoclast. He also wrote a tremendous book called Missing Axioms that indeed is exploring the question of is true nihilism possible, which is to ask if a pre um, an axi a, a, a philosophy without axioms is possible. I can yeah. use the word axioms. Um, the way I like to put it is that we must always live according to axioms that must be missing. Uh, that kind of is a way we talked about it with Samuel Barnes' first words. Like, we can never confirm the axioms of our system, and yet we nevertheless must operate according to axioms that are always kind of hidden from us, which creates a very strange situation, right? Because the moment you look for the axiom, this is where the book The Iconoclast or kind of the, um, the, uh, the this is the mistake of what I call autonomous rationality, where you're trying to create a rationality that doesn't have any axiomatic basis. And since whenever rationality looks for an axiomatic basis, is it will not find it, it can always destroy itself in the effort to become a sort of rationality that is its own grounding and it doesn't have to ultimately ascribe to what I would call non-rationality or a truth, then it becomes something that kind of eats itself. However, if we want to tie this into some of the conversations that we've been having um, on like the meta crisis and in escaping capture, there's something very tempting about, about trying to find a, um, a worldview that doesn't have any axioms, because if it doesn't have any axioms, it feels like it can avoid, well, if, if, it feels like if that's possible, you can avoid capture, because you can always think about, because if everything that, that exists in your worldview is something that be, can be brought under rational scrutiny and rationally considered, then there's always the possibility of escape, right? There's always the possibility of avoiding capture, because there's never anything under your, your worldview of which some force could grab without you being able to detect it because you're stuck in the internal consistency of your rationality and pull you along and uh, create an ide ideology that you're captured in, right? Um, but if on the other hand, philosophy always has to um, have axioms, if rationality always requires a truth, there's a certain um, terror with that because you can in fact be, you know, your truth can, you can be determining rationality according to a truth that you don't even realize you're operating according to, uh, which can be the ideology and all that that Zizek care about, which is terrifying. But then that leaves us a question. All right, then. Well, if that's the case, how do we avoid capture in a manner that accepts the, in a, the inability to escape axioms, even if those axioms must always be experienced as missing, um, so that we are not captured, so that we avoid, say, the game theory dynamics that calls the meta crisis, as we talked about last week, um, and so that we can actually move into a state of absolute knowing. Um, and I think, and then I'll pass it on to Javier, there seems to be different ways of holding axioms. There's um, there's axioms where you don't have any at all, and you attempt a state of no axioms, which is pure deconstruction. Um, you have a, the dogmatist, as Samuel Barnes talked about, where you hold your axioms and they're absolute and no one can change it. There seems to be a mode of holding that's the open hand. And before y'all, you know, we were talking about um, Samuel Barnes brought up the, the meta dogmatist, uh, the someone who kind of holds axioms, can leave them, pick up new axiomatic sets, move on in different things. And that seems to be something that Hegel is engaging in when it comes to absolute knowing, some sort of meta dogmatist, sort of meta axiomatic movement. But I'll pass it on to Javier and Titan. Jason, Dimitri, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for coming in. So please, uh, Javier. You know, I think, I mean, there's always like a funny re return to this because I'm like, I hate the idea of like a presuppositionalist philosophy. <laughs> I've always hated that idea. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't understand. Like for me, I'm like, I don't really care because if you think about it, <laughs> what's an everyday philosophy look like? Okay. It's when you meet another human being and you realize that you have a different presupposition than I do. Right. Right. In that moment of clashing, if you if you actually cultivate like a genuine meeting between people, then what happens is that genuine meeting already allows for the deconstruction itself. <laughs> if you're actually allowing a genuine meeting, right? So um, it's the people that kind of sit in their little corners and try to think for themselves without actually interacting with other people. You know, they just interact with books and texts and like, okay, well, like this is his presupposition, so I'm gonna work my presupposition, whatever. So, but actually, when you interact with a real human being, like it's always that clashing of presuppositions that the deconstruction already allows itself to um, become manifest. And you can you can see this in Hegel too, right? The two men um, in, in the slave and master dialect, right? The two men are meeting each other. Um, it comes a matter of like either life or death, or you know how do you deal with this? <clears throat> um, but I, I think the answer, and also I, I, the the notion of capture, I'm also like, ugh, <laughs> because I mean, really, I, I still go back to Thomas Wynn's idea. It's a matter of doing nothing. Um, 
but I'm going to play on the, the idea of doing nothing because it actually takes work to do nothing. <laughs> right? It actually takes work to do nothing. And, and, and like, this is, you know, what basically all the religions tell you um, in their practice. It actually takes work to do nothing. Um, for example, like, uh, as I was talking to my Buddhist teacher today, he's like, um, there's this uh, paradox, right, in Buddhism where the doctrine is you have no self, right? And yet a lot of the things that you have to do are predicated on self-effort. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, what, if there is no self, then what is striving? What is doing the striving then? You know, and I, I said the same thing. And and there's what, there's like this meditation called like a loving kindness, right? Where you sort of love yourself. And, and I brought up the same question, you know, if I'm loving myself and there is no self, then what am I loving? <laughs> it comes into like the same interesting thing. So Again, um, a lot of religions have answered this, and it's a lot of like predication on doing nothing. Um, that actually we are fundamentally like helpless things, right? The the Hindu path um, was it the knowledge path and the devotion path actually end up being the same thing. Um, <clears throat> the same thing with uh, I think Nishitani says that actually Buddha nature or the, the idea of like original enlightenment is like oh yeah you're already there you already have but <laughs> you already have it <laughs> you know um uh, so but <clears throat> yeah and the, and the same thing with boober the, the you already have the eternal thou within you um that that's the reason why you can recognize a thou in the first place um so i mean yeah I, i'm always uh fascinated by this idea of like having a you know, presuppositionless philosophy, because <laughs> I'm more, you know, when you act, actually interact with people in everyday life, most people don't engage with philosophy. So what are you engaging with? Um, you're engaging with a collision of presuppositions always. Um, and the, the deconstruction, the, the idea that the deconstruction is out there, just to play on Nietzsche's like, that there's no path. The reason why there's no path, in my opinion, is because the path is already here. The, the object that is your obstacle, that is your path. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I'll stop there. Say something on, this, on this, this strange problems that, you know, philosophy sort of brings to us in terms of, in terms of presuppositions. And, you know, and of course, um, one is to distinguish philosophy, the discipline of philosophy as an activity. I don't think we should mix them because, you know, science can be the, as a discipline. A lot of people can be working in a discipline which may not be actually doing what the discipline demands them to do. So that kind of a question can be separated out immediately in, in some senses, and we shouldn't confuse between the two things. But if you start thinking of philosophy as an activity with its own pretty particular history, and we ask, what does it really mean? So for instance, we, I live in India, sages have ex ex existed in India since, I think, time immemorial. And it's very easy to say that they were all doing philosophy. You know, it, it's very natural to sort of uh, make that kind of claim. And they have made many philosophical claims, there's no denying that reality also. But if you look at philosophy as, as, as it exists in, in our times through the Western tradition, uh, I think Deleuze got it right when he said that it, it is an activity of engaging with concepts. You know, you can engage with wisdom in a lot of different ways. But when you particularly engage with concepts, you're doing actually, you know, in some senses, a philosophy. Even Hegel in his, in, in his science of logic in, in goes in that, you know, uh, direction, that concepts become in, a very important sort of uh, field over there. The other thing about doing philosophy is that philosophy, in some senses, cannot take take its own ground for granted, like other discourses can. You know, um, uh, there, there's, a, there's an extremely interesting sort of uh, section in Deleuze's difference in repetition, and uh, I was reading it the other the other day only, so I, something stuck in my mind. Where he's dis dis discussing this relationship between extensionality and intentionality. In some senses, this relationship between what kind of objects predicate can take and what kind of meanings that predicate can have. So in a simple sense, what happens is that if your concept can take, and I'm using the word concept very literally here, I'm wrong, I know, but I don't want to get into the theory of it. But uh, if, your, if your concept can take multiple objects, you know, it, it, it has to sort of sacrifice upon what kind of comprehensive ability it can have. Its comprehension gets reduced. If it can take only a singular object, its comprehension becomes infinite. And in, in some senses, philosophy's uh, task is to find that singular object with an infinite comprehension is possible. 
you know, great philosoph philosophical texts are those texts which actually are able to deal with very particular singularities in their own method itself. And it's not a singularity only in, in the sense of, you know, that they're doing something unique. Uh, it's a singularity in terms of that they are able to find something from a very particular point of seeing something in that sense. It's a view from a very particular singular location in a very specific sense. It's not a view from, say, multiple locations looking at one thing. It's not, which is a philosopher of a distinct style, different, distinct method, distinct, you know, so on and so forth. Great philosophical texts at least have, have those. And as I said, we can distinguish discipline from the activity in, 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 in that sense. And that infinite comprehension actually emerges from the singularity of the object. That's the point I'm trying to sort of get at. You know, and when you start thinking in, in, in this kind of a direction, and then we, and we ask seriously, uh, what does it mean to do philosophy? Uh, we recognize that philosophy actually is a very particular sort of cut with uh, reality. You know, and we know from Freud that human action actually involved to engage with reality, whereas, you know, earlier motor functions were about pleasure principles. Isn't it that that discussion in Freud from pleasure to reality in some senses actually has to go through human action? and action and thinking both. Uh, if you th start thinking in that direction, the very act of thinking, which, which connects you back to action, actually has something of an overture of um, um, sort of knowledge, wisdom, and so on and so forth. And when that knowledge and wisdom cuts across with concepts, like it happened in modernity, and it may be a good thing, bad thing, I think time will tell to us. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> we, 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 we get across something very specific in, 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 the, in our history, which we, which we think of lost. And then how do we think through with this beast? And I, I think it's, these are open questions that I, that I would leave everybody here to think with. I, I think that's super interesting what you say. I, I, I echo a lot of, uh, the sentiments you said, I think. Yeah. On the one hand, of course, uh, you can philosophize on the street, but, um, like even Hegel, uh, things about what is unphilosophy, right? What what this is, what what is philosophy proper, which is to say, from this dynamics of logic and doing logic, right? As you said, philosophy think philosophy is a kind of activity, and it's a weird activity. And and you are correct that that it is different from other subject matter precisely because because of this, the, philosophy is an activity, right? But and it could be various activities, but all of them are united in thinking. What philosophy is, is basically thinking, but it's thinking in a, in a kind of self. It's like a, it's like those Russian nesting dolls, but they somehow eat each other. I don't know. Like, like, so like a, like a Klein bottle where the inside and the outside can kind of talk to each other. So the dynamic between, let's say, logic right because in everyday life and this is why you can philosophize on the street in everyday life you use logic but you're you know uh, metaphysics is about this about thinking when thinking you don't need to do metaphysics but when you do metaphysics you need to put thinking into it so that would be, I think, the difference between, let's say, uh, what's called unphilosophy. And I'm not trying to delegitimize it, right? It's, it, it, you can learn truth. The po truth can come from anything, really. But if you want philosophical kind of truth, the, the rigor is in, as you said, philosophy that doesn't take its own ground for granted. And I think that's what the presuppositionless philosophy is actually about. It's not about establishing the, the strongest ground. But it's about addressing the problem that the ground is tenuous, let's say, depending on your theory. Chetan Anand in the Hegel Anthology says, in that sense, the search for theory is a search for a master position alienated from its servile dimensions. I thought this was uh, very interesting, this, this seeking of the master position. And in regards to, to the self and the no self, well, for Nietzsche, it's virtuous not to be selfless, <laughs> but to be selfish. And in uh, this wonderful book by Alenka Zupancic, which my computer doesn't want you to see, <laughs> it, uh, Zizek writes, writes an introduction. 
And he says that he gives the, the greatest compliment you can ever give to a companion philosopher. He says that when he was reading this book, he kept feeling the deepest envious hatred for Alain Kazupancic. <laughs> So all these dimensions of the ground, the seeking of the master position, uh, selfishness as a virtue, uh, envious hatred, like this is philosophy. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. And uh, yeah, dimensions like that, I mean, that's that's something you, you, you have to work through with yourself. And, you know, if I look at my own life, I used to be very much into communism, and I would say that I was interested in philosophy back then, but if you would say something that I deemed to be like whatever bourgeois or fascistic, I would outright reject it, not listen to you. You're hypnotized. <laughs> like I was so so deep in in that stuff as a teenager, and uh, I think that you know by like like Javier, you said like by going to the encounter, you know like. Like, you can ask my boss, he's not a philosopher at all, but he said one thing that I thought was very interesting. He said, philosophy is not about reading books. It's about when you read the book and you go out into the world and talk with people. <laughs> like, that's where it actually happens. He never reads philosophy books, by the way. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I really liked uh, what he said there. So, like, it's in those genuine encounters where you, um, yeah, you encounter you know, like that alien otherness and things you don't like. For example, I, I mean, since Zizek is so open about exposing himself about envious hatred, let me do it as well. First time I was watching uh, Cadell Lost on his YouTube uh, channel, I was like, what the fuck? Who is this guy? And what, the, <laughs> does, what the fuck does he think uh, he's talking about? This uh, bourgeois academic uh, whatever. And like for me, like philosophy is kind of dealing with with that and that would also be like spiritual practice and specifically of course tantra is interesting for me because in the in the sexual realm all of these uh you know tendencies can explode like jealousy and uh, whatever so yeah how does that relate to to ground and groundless prepositionless philosophy i don't know but i think that you know like working with the affects in philosophy and um yeah working through that that's really a uh, very important uh, aspect of it well well real quick and then i'll give it to mr javier um i love the russian dolls thing that was great jason that was hilarious and chitan beautiful I, I i always did like to lose when he talked about history as working with concepts themselves and what's interesting is it's almost like everything because you think about you can think about anything and since therefore there's a concept involved, everything has traces of philosophical potential in it or traces of philosophy, but is not philosophy as Deleuze describes. And I think that kind of gradient thinking where like what we really should kind of call philosophy has something to do with the act of thinking about thinking. But since we can think about everything, there's a part of something involved in philosophy that can be involved in anything, thus creating this feeling that there can always be philosophy. And I think the way that Mr. Um, Barnes describes the sub-questions of philosophy is like that, like you're thinking about things, therefore you can bring a philosophical approach. But then when you but then when you have philosophy as the meta question, which is when you philosophize about philosophy and you start moving in the direction of concepts about concepts, what does that do? And what's interesting is it seems to be that you have um, you have kind of pure thought, autonomous re thought, which is problematic because it's never concrete, but then you have kind of a pure concretion that never ever involves abstraction and that's an a. so you have an a is a in pure abstraction and you have it you you have an a is a in pure abstraction and you have an a is a in pure concretion okay if we go back to last week's conversation it seems to be the case following say the daniel slyamach or all these people that the meta crisis has game theory dynamics that if you're in an aa rather it is in pure pure abstraction or pure concretion you're, con you're not escaping the game theory dynamics that are creating the meta crisis, okay? So you have to somehow get AB, which we talk about all the time. What is AB? AB is the movement between those two, the concretion and the abstract, right? Which, which inherently requires negation, right? That's where you get all three because you either have to be negating the abstraction or negating the concretion with a new abstraction. There has to be a negation and then a negation of the negation and all these fun Hegelian terms. Well, here's the thing. If you are moving between pure abstraction and pure concretion, that is emotional. That who, 
There's only one, there's only one thing in the universe that we know of that can move between those two realms, the subject. Only the subject can move between the concrete and the abstract. And, I, you know, maybe dolphins have subjects. I don't know. Uh, they seem to be pretty good at various games. But generally speaking, the subject is uniquely positioned um, to move between the, um, the, 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 the pure concrete and the pure abstract. The subject is unique in the potential for negation. Like the ability of negation is what the subject seems unique in, and therefore bringing the abstraction and the concretion together in unique ways. But this is where I think what you're saying, Dimitri, is so important, is because if this unique AB um, onto epistemology requires the subject, well, the subject is also what? The entity that feels jealousy, that feels envy, that has sexual urges, that wants relationships. So you have to deal with the reality of the subject in order to get at AB. If you skip the reality of the subject, you're not going to be dealing with AB because if indeed AB is a result of a movement between abstraction and concretion, what is that? Practice, action, art, disposition, modes of being, all the stuff that we've been talking about, a certain way of carrying oneself, of knowing when to move into abstraction and when to move into concretion and back and forth and how to approach it. There's an entire skill now that's involved. Well, everyone knows it's very difficult to develop a skill if you don't emotionally attune yourself, if you don't discipline yourself, if you don't learn how to relate to other people. So once we take the negation as primary uh, for philosophy to be AB as opposed to AA, then you have to bring in the psychoanalytical realities. You have to bring in the emotional realities that come into play. And then I'll pass it. So before, and then before passing it on to Javier and then back to Dimitri, um, I am of the impression that AB is how you avoid the Nash equilibria that define the meta crisis or all the game theory dynamics that Daniel Slymacher and these people talk about. All of those game theory dynamics emerge, in my opinion, out of AAs, various AAs, whether it be in politics, technology, we can go through it all, climate change, all these different things. All of these things are the logical um, game theory result, Nash equilibria, that comes from AA. So if you want to avoid the meta crisis or respond to the meta crisis, you somehow have to be AB, but that will require all the movement. And the last thing I'll say is a word that was coming to mind as people were talking, um, because I think Buber is in this business, Javier. Um, and I think what we're describing is like this. Instead of a presupposition, it's almost like one is looking for intersuppositions. You're looking for suppositions that emerge between people or between AAs, intersupposition, -sup as opposed to presupposition or no supposition. Like you can just be like, you can, well, I think missing axiom shows you can't actually be a true nihilist that literally believes nothing because the moment you do something, you have to be acting according to a value, even if you don't own it. And missing axiom is a great book. So it seems like presupposition is bad. If by that we mean certainty holding axiomatic totalitarianism, and it seems like no supposition is bad, Right. So it seems like we are looking for something like inter suppositions, uh, something that is this kind of this space that emerges between presuppositions that then arises to an inter supposition that seems to be a B. And I think also when Mr. Wynn talks about nothing, it would seem to be like the nothing that you earn is a kind of inter supposition where the N.O. is in parentheses. There would be more to say on that, but I will pass it on to Javier. Yeah, I mean, I think you're. I mean, that, that's like the Buddhist answer always, right? Between two extreme positions, you always take the middle way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there would be agreement on that, like that, you know, the inter supposition, <laughs> you know, the inter. Um, I mean, basically, you know, it's funny about human beings. We're the only ones that don't have a master position because we don't, we, <laughs> we're the only ones that can't be what we are. <laughs> that's like the problem. We can't be what we are. Everything else can be what it is. We have a problem with being what we are, or we don't even know what we are. So we, we have that, those problems. Um, but really, I mean, I think it it's embodied in just this one simple koan, right? To do philosophy is to basically do this, to ride the buffalo while walking. You know, that 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 is the the the, the power of the subject is to literally do that, to ride ride the buffalo while walking. And I'm going to play this on Nietzsche's term, right? It's <laughs> it's basically at the same time slaying the dragon and becoming the dragon. <laughs> you know, um, being the child giving birth to the mother. Um, you know, uh, so <laughs> like I I know I'm like playing with this stuff, but I mean that's what I'm trying to get at is that you you nailed it, Daniel, when we're talking about the subject has this sort of in betweenness that 
um, that 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 is what that is what we are <laughs> that in betweenness, um, and, and that's the problem that we have fundamentally, um, because as you notice with subjects, we can intellectually grasp things, but obviously the praxis is going through the emotional gap of that thing that we didn't we understood intellectually, right? We're like, yeah, I get it, you know, okay, Hegel, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not until you meet like a Hegelian girlfriend that you start having problems, <laughs> okay? Because then now you start having like the emotional gap <laughs> becoming, or like I think the way Cadell described to me, I think he had once dated like a Delusian, right? You start going through that emotional gap, right? <laughs> because it's one thing to read the Deleuze, and then there's one thing to actually see somebody and be in a relationship with somebody that is actually Delusian. <laughs> So now you're really going through the emotional gap of that praxis. That is real praxis right there. And it is right in front of your face. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on. <laughs> First, I just have to add, you need to change your dating profile. Uh, I don't know how wide the description you got. You got to work on that. Second, in honor of a greener side of Sam, um, a lot of coffee can be read as a certain envy of animals. Like he talks about like a dog or the panther who are able to have a pure being while Joseph K and others are stuck into becoming. So there's a like, man, if only we were animals. Uh, there's a kind of uh, interesting way. And I'll also note that, yes, humans seem unique in this betweenness. Um, I would have to expand on this. There is no betweenness in nature. That's why humans are also fundamentally a negation. Because there is no betweenness and no betweenness as we are describing it. Uh, and so betweenness and negation with the subject go together. But I'll pass it to uh, Dimitri and Chitan. Yes. I mean, this is such a, this is very deep, guys. <laughs> Trying not to fall in the abyss. Yeah, the, this, uh, <laughs> oh, there you went. Uh, what's, what was I thinking? Oh, yeah, the animals. Yeah, we're also an animal, but... Kant said that we're we're an animal who needs a master, and that's uh, that's that's you know Nietzsche says that um, the creator, the the one who who makes the values, is very powerful, you know. And like I, I mean, I think maybe it would be nice if you could live hundreds of years to see actually how values <laughs> arise and get passed on and how they are disseminated actually, because I think it's such a, so extremely complex. Uh, but there, there is this, so Chetan, what you to talk about in this essay, the, 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 the young student uh, in general has a lot of desire to ascending to the master position. He really, he wants to talk so the others have to listen. And, you know, he wants to have the last word, basically. But what is a good philosopher? Is it that guy who talks and then the others don't, don't say anything uh, anymore? You know, like, or is a philosopher someone who, who listens very well? Or is it the one who is very good at reflecting the other back at himself? I mean, I, I basically, uh, I'm just saying that I have loads of questions. Let me ask just one uh, more concrete question. Daniel, so you said pure abstraction and pure concretion. Could you clarify again what you mean by, like, what, what, what would it be to go from a concretion to an abstraction? Is that to have another idea or something? Oh, sure. Very fair question. Um, You know, basically, we could just say, like, autonomous, like, pure thought, pure physics, you know, I'm using the kind of Hegelian terms to show that when you're missing that negation, then you can't have a relation between those two, and you get it, instead of a negation, you get an effacement. So you could say that, that what, what humans could do is engage in a dialectical process between the, between the abstract and the concrete, or the actual in, in, in thinking uh, that we can engage in. And what negation involves in is the moment I look at this laptop and I say, that is a laptop, then in a way I am negating the physical experience of it with the abstract notion of what it is, which then makes it possible for the thing to be meaningful to me, but then it does so by making a map that isn't the territory. So there's always a kind of tragedy that's going on. And yet, if there was no physical laptop, I probably would never generate the idea of a laptop. Like why, L ideas are always um, made in the image and likeness per se of things that I experience. And even you can get into like a unicorn. I know Locke makes this, this example where a unicorn is just a horse and a horn. You see them and you put them together. So even traces of imagination are going to have experience that are going to be part of it in different things. Uh, so there's always a kind of negation. And so likewise, 
it's also when you think the idea of a laptop, um, there's a way in which you're negating the actuality because you're treating the idea as if it is equivalent to the laptop. You almost have to, because if you didn't, you wouldn't be thinking it like it, you would. Now you can instantly remind yourself that it's just an idea and therefore it's just an abstraction, but that is not a natural move. What's more natural, that's kind of a, that's Hegelian training almost, where you're constantly reminding yourself that you're dealing with maps, where it's more natural to treat the idea as if it is equal to the phenomenon, or it is natural to treat phenomenon as if they're all that matter, that you don't really need ideas. Like both of these are ditches on either side of the road and the name of the game, and both of them can end you up, like we were saying earlier, like either treating ideas as all you need can end you up in the game theory dynamic that contribute to the meta crisis, or treating physicality as all you need can end you up in the meta crisis. So what you need is the dialectical motion between the two, and the dialectic for me is fund fundamentally characterized by a negation, uh, because you have to negate one or the other uh, in order to get the other and to get that back and forth. But there's always a tragedy that's going to be engaged, that's going to be happening there. I was recently talking about Jason about my uh, my past, and so I I was really into all this uh, communist stuff like Maoism, like the worst stuff. And, you know, during the Corona crisis, I kind of, this kind of inaugurated this self-reflection, retraction from all of that uh, activism, whatever. And uh, to me, like, I never felt like, oh, communism, uh, I don't see the value of that anymore. Like, what actually like help me to supersede myself and to re relinquish you know that uh, worldview those abstractions was actually that i kind of by reading and thinking and reflecting on all of this discovered that all these people were self heretical right so it wasn't it wasn't that like i thought oh these people embody the communist project so the communist project is horrible <laughs> no it's like i love the communist project and i want to continue the legacy of it and i don't think these people are doing it good enough so i always uh am wary <laughs> when people say oh yeah don't over identify with things because it is through ver through over identification that you can actually critique things uh, as well you know because i mean i wouldn't uh, say i identify as a communist even though uh, you know i learned a lot from uh, from it but yeah, so there is there is this thing where, you know, the partial nature of truth that you get at and that is kind of like partisan in a sense, you know, like in psychoanalysis, you take a stance. In in, uh, in politics, you always take a stance. Like there is something um, to that. So I, yeah, I, I don't think like Hegel is a, a politically a centrist. Like I think he's very pragmatical. Uh, but yeah, I think that's... No, and I, and I should clarify, I think there's a big difference between... Um, Hegel would warn against, say, if we use the language of over-identification, over-identification with an ontological dimension, not necessarily like a, a stance on a position of something. Like, so for example, there's a difference between overly identifying, say, with the concrete at the expense of, there seems to be a difference also between identification at the expense of versus saying, you know, I truly believe in this and therefore I'm going to do it. We'll talk about in reconstructing it as a, um, a real choice and actually how a real choice, like a commitment, like you're describing is actually the only way anything's concrete. Until you like really, 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 really choose something, it's not concrete. It's tentative. So I think what you're getting, so um, no, I don't think, you know, I'm not supporting, Is that's actually one of the difficulties of all this, where like when we talk about betweenness, middle way, dialect, they all are similar and there's kind of a centralist feel to it, but it's not necessary. For me, the way I try to describe it in Reconstructing it is a, and then I'll pass it on, is the dialectic ultimately has to be in service of a real choice. There is no reality until there's a commitment. Like a commitment is what makes something real, actually. Like, why today does everyone feel like the world's a simulation and that nothing's real and what's going on? It's because everyone wants to open, keep possibility open, right? They want to, like, keep their options. Well, guess what? Until you, like, really choose something to the point where you're going to commit to it and not leave it behind, it's not concrete. Um, and in fact, it's not real. It's not going to feel real. So the dialectic that we are describing, which sounds like a, I mean, you're right, Dimitri, there's a way in which it sounds like a certain centricism, there's a certain citricism. It's ultimately in service of a real choice uh, because the concrete part of that requires the commitment. Concrete means committed, um, you know, that there's a commitment. So I think, so I would clarify that point. Um, I would also add, 
that I think sometimes is important. And this is a, an additional, like when we talk about abstraction, negation, concretion, it can always kind of sound like it's in that order, but you're always already in con something concrete. You're always already in abstraction and they can, it, it's not, it's always different orders, all of them happening kind of together at the same time. And likewise, you can almost talk about abstraction, negation, concretion, negation, abstraction. Like if there's another negation after that, that triad. And likewise, in some situations, you could reverse it and talk about concretion, negation, abstraction. So I think like that triad, it's always important to realize that it's not necessarily experienced in the same sequence every single time. And there's a way in which all three are happening uh, together. Uh, you know, and that's that's always the fun of Hegel. Like absolute knowing is something that you're always already in. You, it was mentioned with enlightenment. Like uh, it's not the same. Absolute knowing is not the same as enlightenment. But Javier was talking about how that's something you're already in. Well, likewise with Hegel, you get to the end of absolute knowing and realize that all of the parts of the phenomenological journey were already in play. It was just a process of making the implicit explicit as you went uh, along. But let me pass it on to Jason and Javier. Comment real quick. Uh, yeah, I basically agree uh, with everything so far. Uh, regar but regarding the partial view of truth that you mentioned, Dimitri, and you know, sometimes you just kind of you face the problem of uh, over identifying or not over identifying. But sometimes you do need to over identify, right? But what's uh, what's and this is why I think the answer is to think scientifically, which is to say to bring to choose time, to choose to be temporal, to, to use Daniel's term of choice, right? You choose to look at the progression of time because sometimes, yeah, the truth is partial, and maybe part of it, part of the truth becoming a whole is you over identifying with it right you never you don't know you just don't know until until you check it out and um regarding the comment about re you know you commit your commitment is prior to reality i uh, so i agree with that but i will also add that you have nothing but reality and you know they, they sort of appear together i would say um what you commit to is automatically real. Reality has this Klein bottle thing going on as well, where um, your commitment becomes concrete and it's part of reality. And then that's the reality you work off of. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I can really relate to the <laughs> the, the over-identification uh, part. And it, it does seem like actually, in my opinion, it does seem like that's actually the only way to... Uh, you know, like, and truly encounter something really like, I think, I think that's why th this is why, like, I haven't left religion because I keep trying to over identify with it, but I keep finding, I keep finding more holes. <laughs> I keep finding more holes. And so like, I'm here, but I don't have a religious identity. So I'm like in between, but I know that I can't stay in this in betweenness that ultimately I have to come out of this by picking a path and, and sticking to it. That, that is the only way. It's kind of like when C.S. Lewis talks about um, the beginning of mere Christianity. He says, um, those that have picked a room, they're already like, you know, discovering what that room is about. But, uh, you know, most of us are like still in the hallway. <laughs> you know, we haven't actually picked a path. Um, <clears throat> so, the, so the aim is obviously to pick a path. Um, and, and that's the purpose. And that's why I like Buber. And that's why I like Nietzsche, because they are what I call philosophers of responsibility. They're philosophers of responsibility. And so, in my opinion, if you want people to do right philosophy, it's not about, um, you know, handing them a book and like, you know, read this, read Plato. Like, no, it's actually about, and, and Buber talks about this in Between Man and Man, it's about the formation of character. That the teacher, the teacher sees the pupil in what he actually is, meaning that in his actual becoming, that is the aim of the teacher to see the pupil in his actual becoming. The pupil does not even see it in himself. Um, and that's the problem. And that might, that also might uh, register as to why the pupil wants to sort of, you know, either overtake the teacher or the master, but really the master in the pupil is actually his own becoming that he does not yet see. Um, and so it's the formation of character. So the challenge of the teacher, as Buber points out, is that you have to have this moment of meeting between the pupil and the teacher where the teacher actually sees himself in the pupil. 
Like there's that moment where the teacher actually sees himself in the pupil that there is a genuine meeting, but it's not mutual. It's still like a half, uh, a half meeting because actually the student has yet to actually see himself in the other. That's the problem also. Um, so in, in terms of like the, the positions, like master positions, I think Buber's answer is actually the whole aim of it is to have some mutuality. Um, <clears throat> because actually, uh, this is a really good example of like having concreteness <laughs> and meeting the abstract. Buber actually proposes a very interesting like uh, philosophical like experiment. He says, okay, if you were to actually meet God, <laughs> like to actually meet God, he's like, do you actually think all your presuppositions about God would still remain in the moment of that meeting of God. <laughs> you know? So he's like, actually, in the moment of meeting God, all those presuppositions you had about God would just vanish and dissipate in that very moment. So he's like, what What do you have left? All you have is a, is a moment God. That's what Buber calls a moment God. And that's it. And that interaction itself already works itself inside of you. There is no, um, um, so it seems like this uh, dissipation of the abstract already begins to do is developing inside of you um, the moment we sort of encounter the concrete. Um, now, in terms of enlightenment and um, absolute knowing, well, I mean, nirvana is predicated, enlightenment is predicated on nirvana, and the way Buddhists understand nirvana is that nirvana can never be. Nirvana can only ever be described in negative terms. Like whatever you say is nirvana is not nirvana. <laughs> the same thing like with the mystics say, like whatever you call is God, then that is not God. Like it's it's a purely like negative um, term that goes above duality. But yeah. I just quickly uh, sort of say something. Uh, you know, one of the things that we need to think about philosophy is its, in, in its particularity as it sort of emerges in its, you know, Western context, and I was just trying to like, you know, so one, one of one of the things that, you know, the reason philosophy resists itself is because it can never be comfortable with the ground of philosophy itself also. You know, it's of course not comfortable with other grounds, but there is something about philosophy because when it's not comfortable with other grounds, it, it cannot be fully comfortable. If you look at, say, Deleuze's reaction to Hegel, or, you know, uh, even Foucault's reaction to Hegel philosophy generally, you know, what you what you understand is that 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 reaction actually emerged because philosophical spirit itself was reaching a point where it was collapsing upon itself, where it was trying to break from its own past in some senses, you know. And if you look at if you read Hannah Arendt, she has a very brilliant description about if you look at say, philosophy started with Plato. If, if you think of it in that sense, Socrates Plato. If you combine that, and you start thinking, what was it? What was Plato trying to do? Plato actually tried to play a, make a break between this world and the other world. And he realized that there can be a form of thinking which through which a certain form of social governance becomes possible. You know, and it is in that context, it is in that break with the other world and that collective realization that philosophy as a modern project emerged. Sometimes we generalize it to all forms of mystical, so spiritual quests and so on and so forth but it, it it wasn't so and it 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 found its actually end point with hegel and marx as Hannah Arendt would write and be, be beyond marx you know it started reaching it, it, it you know it, it already started fragmenting in some sense that is when it reached the french school it was it it was already facing certain pressure in which that kind of discussion was happening and which is why jack's reaction to hegel is not simply a reaction that hegel is a great thinker okay let's affirm him it's a reaction towards affirming the tradition itself jack realized that you cannot completely negate the tradition that you're bringing coming from if you do that you have no ground to stand so it is in that sense it philosophy can't be groundless as you know Deleuze and Foucault were trying to sort of probably um, imagine and it is in that particularity I think we need to start thinking about philosophy today you know um, uh, and if you start thinking about in the particularity and you start thinking about this something this, this question of the middle term that that we've been talking about um, at least I think post Nietzsche um, you know Nietzsche said it very beautifully that, that forgiveness is a very late fruit Anybody who tries to give it to you too early, uh, you should be skeptical of, <laughs> you know, in, in, in that sense. Um, similarly, if you, if you want to think of the middle way, middle way is a very late fruit. A lot of time when, 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 it, when it comes earlier than it should come, it starts arresting life. It stops the, the movement of life itself. 
uh, how do we how do we think through this? For for instance, you can look at middle class as it emerged today. You know, uh, I don't know about your country, but at least in India, middle class emerged with a lot of hope. You know, aspirations. People were moving from village to the city, and people thought they were going to do great things. But the authoritarian turn that we see in India today is exactly emerged from middle class. You know, middle class are the most uh, uh, consistent voters of the right wing pot politics in India in, in that sense. So the middle actually can be very very overpowering to both extremes in some sense. It can give you the worst of both the world if it comes uh, too early. And and how do we or how do we think to that? You know, That's very well put. If anything has any last things to say, please feel free to to raise your hand. I, I fear I must travel this afternoon, so I'll, I'll have to run here. Through. I've very much enjoyed this conversation. Um, a few things. Um, first off, I should note, although I said that there were no um betweenness in nature, it is of course possible that um some of the work that Mr. Bard, uh, pan dialecticism, is certainly possible, and that the very fundamental nature of reality there could be some sort of dialectical structure. However, in our immediacy. There is not between us, and therefore we have to bring that to the table. So I would have that as a point of classification. Second, it was brought out, Dimitri talked about how humans are creatures that want a master, that they need a master. It would seem as if we have to choose between um, having a master, being a master, or achieving, or achieving mastery. And for me, thinking about like absolute knowing and all this stuff we're talking about in terms of skill, in terms of habit, is where we direct ourselves toward a mastery of a kind of onto epistemology that is very difficult, but we kind of scratch that need for some role of a master in our life. It's not good to be mastered. It can also be a problem to be a kind of master in a dictatorial sense. So how do we become someone with mastery? And I think that also feeds into what Raymond has been writing in notes from a pod on the need of thymos. I know the Stora, Stoa has been talking about thymos. There's something about thymos and human needs. And I think thinking in terms of mastery is quite good. But here's the thing. The only way you ever develop mastery is with a real choice. You have to really choose to something and then master it, right? So there has to be a kind of, I think the mistake is the conflation of over-identification with fundamental. Fundamentalism. So a lot of people think if you over-identify with something, then you're a fundamentalist, right? And that's what they're trying to avoid. So then they say, well, don't do that. You shouldn't over-identify. No, 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 no. The only way to ever make anything concrete is to give your life to it, <laughs> to pour yourself into it all in. And actually, how can you ever experience a death that you need a good kind of death unless you pour your life into something to the point that makes you ultra vulnerable. And in fact, when you super identify with a thinker, and Javier has talked about this, and then you find their shortcomings, there is a kind of death you suffer, and yet that death is good for you. And that speaks to the death on the battlefield of Thymos and the things we need to go through to scratch a certain dimension of ourselves that Raymond's talked about, the Stoa. Um, and, and that is found in mastery. Uh, mastery of which requires um, that level of commitment and then a vulnerability because what if you commit your life to say a friendship and that person betrays you like an Iago and Orthello or what if you give your life to writing novels and no one wants to publish it or read it right you know there is a real risk there that comes with a real choice and a kind of um create uh thymos I call it non-rationality not irrationality but a kind of non-rationality to put yourself into something to that degree and yet that is what is necessary and I don't think there is any other way to actually do the Hegel stuff without the real choice. There is no other way to AB without that level of a real choice. Okay, then. Well, then the issue seems to be that there's something about a real choice. What does it mean to have a real choice in intersupposition as opposed to presupposition? What does a real choice commitment to a kind of intersupposition means? Well, that means to, to like be willing to ultimately identify with something knowing that you may have to give it up, knowing that someone could come along in a pure encounter and make it vanish in your hand. Likewise, if you write a novel, you know, I could, you know, we just put out a book, someone could come along and say your book sucks. And, and it's like something is taken from you. Something dies, right? You put all your time, it's taken, right? But, but likewise, you could put your time in your family and you grow your kids and your kids grow up and they never want to talk to you. And it kind of goes away, right? And the, the, all your axioms go away. If you are not living a life that has the possibility of a experience that then makes everything melt away, like Javier was saying, and it's just the pure encounter, then you are not, you are not engaging in a real choice of intersupposition. And therefore you are not engaging in a real choice of concretion that could be negated into abstraction, negated and, and transformed. And you are therefore not engaged in AB. And it seems to be the case that to go back to what we've been talking about, in order for the world, <laughs> big claim to avoid the game theory dynamics that end us up in the meta crisis, the average person on planet Earth 
has to engage in the ontoepistemology of AB, which require the real choice and all these different things we talked about. So it brings us to the question, is it possible to spread the amount of people who are able to incubate and cultivate an AB kind of way of life, a real choice in favor of in intersubjectivity, a life of which is seeking mastery on something that in seeking that mastery requires a real choice that makes them vulnerable to something of which is just a raw encounter and leaves them suspended in a sort of terrifying way. Um, and yet without risk of that terror, then all that can end up happening is we're sucked into the game theory dynamics of the meta crisis and therefore do not address it and therefore all of those different things. So the question we find ourselves in, can it be done? And I'll also note though, if you make the real choice, you, make, you run the risk of becoming the dogmatist that, you know, that Samuel Barnes is warning about, right? Well, you become the dogmatist because you made a real choice. But this is why it has to, I think, be a real choice of intersub, you know, intersupposition, because that is where you get the metadogmatist, as we noted. And I think that a metadogmatist is someone who is seeking mastery of a skill to exist in the dialectical space of AB that I think seems necessary for avoiding all of these Nash equilibrium of the meta crisis. But then the, the question we have, we talked about last time, the problem of scale seems difficult to scale. Can you spread the conditions of which arise to this meta, to this uh, meta dogmatism? Uh, I think it's an important question and I enjoy speaking to you. If anyone has last things to say, please uh, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I <laughs> this uh, issue with skill and AB, I would like to start with myself. <laughs> Can I do it myself? Can you do it yourself? Like truly? <laughs> Can you be honest with that? That's really the the thing for me right now in my life. I will just add to that, Dimitri, when we were talking like it seems that scale doesn't work. What has to do is a spreading of the conditions that makes each like that makes more individuals to themselves engage in that practice to themselves right? That creates the condition that has that sort of inspiration to themselves that make them say, wait a minute, I'm seen to be in Plato's cave. How do I leave it? Wait a minute, I need to be an Oberman. How do I rise to the occasion? How do you spread the conditions that incubate self-work? And that is kind of the difference between, in some respects, scale and spread. So no, I, I think that's that's very well put. Uh, Chitan. Uh, I just could not waste much time now, but I, uh, this is a, we were discussing last time also, and I wanted to say it when I sort of you know, uh, got lost in it. Um, what what we need to I, I think the way we need to think about the meta crisis is something much more particular than we've been discussing here. We need to change the way we framing the problem because some things emerge only at the epigenetic level. We are trying to trace the meta crisis only at an individual level. It will it has effects on the indiv in, in, individual in, in, in that sense. But we need to be much more particular about what do we mean by the meta crisis at a social level? That is when we can respond to it. I, th I think if we start responding to it as an ideal ideal crisis, where at what point would man became become have an absolute knowledge or have an mastery over himself, or you know, uh, in those terms, I think I think those would be the solution to almost all problems in human history. You know, if 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 we frame any problem in human history and we give that as an answer, it would be an ideal answer. Uh, and 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 with, and that should make us suspicious of that answer itself. In in that in that sense, and and, and I think uh, we need to start thinking of that problem in much more particular way, so that we can respond to it in its particularity. You know, why are these things being important and healthy and good and you know, and it is in that sense the question of conditions would emerge. The conditions would emerge when we respond to that. You know, meta crisis in its very, very, then we can have a discussion about maybe next time in continuing discussion. What is that particularity of the meta crisis in some senses? And we can, we can, you know, so it, it will not be visible at the individual level in that sense. It is something which will be available at the social scale itself. You know? No, I, I 100% agree. And I'll just say one of the, you know, I kind of spent the week looking for case studies, like, and I'm interested in the DALI technology as we talked about earlier, sort of like, what does it mean to respond to that? like in a Hegelian manner. And then like, if we, exa if we examine that as a case study, can one from that start talking about a bigger thing? So no, I think at this point, exactly right. There, I don't think there's enough talks and then I'll pass it to Javier. Um, I don't think there's enough quote unquote case studies in the Metacrit, you know, where you're really getting into something concrete. It stays in this sort of big level, which again, the big is real. I mean, there is a big, but it has to, it has to come to some sort of concrete example. I, I completely agree. So Javier, please. And that example is actually very good, actually. I would completely agree with you. That's a good point to start the discussion upon it. That's it. Yeah. I'll try to make, I'll try to wrap this up. Um the yeah, the problem with scale, like we as we've been talking about, Daniel. Um 
I, I, I think I kind of understand where Chaton's coming from. I think so. I think I understood. I might not have understood, <laughs> but I'm going to try to relay this as, as the way I, I kind of grasped at it. Um, it seems to me like when we talk about social, um, socially kind of looking at the meta crisis, um, everyone is giving their own answer in its very emergence and its very uh, particularity. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess the thing that I, I feel like we can answer it socially is by looking at what I would call the everyday meta meta crisis. What is the what how what what is the how do we describe what an everyday um, meta crisis looks like? And the only way that we could have like some type of depiction, and this actually kind of roots with the <laughs> I'm going to relay this to my uh, Japanese and Buddhism class. One of the biggest controversies is what is state Buddhism? And the the problem that they had was they were defining it by the regulations that rooted in Japan. But one of the most, um, one scholar criticized this. He says, actually, the way to define state Buddhism is to individually look at the groups and how they responded with their own practices in the midst of those regulations. So... When we're talking about the uh, meta crisis, we have to look at how is everybody responding to that meta crisis, whether they are aware of it or not, because that would be also a response. And how is how are they giving their answers, and how does that intertwine um, with that messiness of of meeting each other with all of our answers to that crisis? Because I mean, ultimately, it's not about we need to respond. But it's the very fact that we're already responding. <laughs> That's the problem. We're already responding. So we need to describe what is that response before we can even say or, or give a clue to what we need to respond with. Um, because I, as, as to be honest, I don't know what everybody's responding with. Everyone's just saying there's a crisis. But that's the problem is like, well, you're already responding. So what is it? <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I, that's why I like it. No, very good. You're like Joseph K. You're guilty of a crime. You don't know there's a crisis. I don't know what's going on. What the heck, man? What did I do? Um, no, that's very good. I, I will note um, a lot of the idea of the meta crisis is people are responding to, say, their national interests in a manner that escalates us toward nuclear war or that everyone is responding to their economy in a manner that leads to um, non zero sumness on a global economy. So game theory, like Nash equilibrium is a situation where when everyone is rational, you get a suboptimal result. I also call it a rational impasse. It's where when everyone does what's rational, they end at an impasse and it's not good. So the response that everyone is already in is, according to a Daniel Slymacher, and a lot of the people in that field is following game theory dynamics that are extremely problematic. Now, of course, one, you know, Hegel would say, well, wait, are you sure? You know, there's a danger here. And this gets into the whole dark Renaissance game B discussion, so on and so forth. But the idea of the meta crisis is that, is that people are already responding in a manner that falls into game theory dynamics that are problematic. Now, you could disagree with that if you wanted. You could say that, no, that's not the case and that you're predicting the future and that's going to lead to trouble and you're not doing what Hegel told you to do. That's exactly right. Uh, but that, I think, is how they would respond. And so the notion of a lot of the people is like, well, if you changed how people thought, that would transform how they acted in these situations and you would not end up in those game theory dynamics or Nash equilibrium because you end up in those based on how people define rational, right? Like what is in their self-interest. So can you transform what, what people define in their self-interest to something that's more, say, intersubjective or involves other people so that what is rational is not a Nash equilibrium situation, but something, something different. Uh, so that, I think, is what they would say. Um, but then, of course, that still begs the question, okay, what does it mean to engage in a kind of thinking that does not fall into the game theory dynamic? And that's what I'm calling game, you know, AB as opposed to AA. And I think looking at Dolly could sort of be a helpful case study on what on what that looks like. Um, but with that, my friends, I have greatly enjoyed the conversation. I fear that the capture of the outer exterior world is forcing me away. I really appreciate your time, everyone. This has been a true joy. Um, and and mm -hmm. thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. I'm so, I really, really, yeah. really Thank you so this. much as well. This yeah, has thank been you. thank you, thank you so much, my friends. I, I bye love bye. you. It's really a treat. So thank you, everyone.